Okay, so basically today we have a, we have this is the first webinar after Ramadan for Muslims. So more than one half month, I think two months ago since we had our last webinar. So I'm a bit rusty, but I think we should do well today because we have an exceptional uh, 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 professional and also exceptional voice because I listened to her voice. We did some rehearsals uh, earlier this week or last week. Basically, that the title today is Your Brain on Graphics. Okay, and we have none other than. Uh, Okay, I might pronounce the name wrong again, but Kani Malamed, uh, which is also known as the e-learning coach. She has a website. I will share all the links in the chat box as we go along. She consults, she writes, she speaks in the fields of online learning, visual communication, and information design. She publishes the popular website, the e-learning coach, and is the author of the instruction design guru iPhone app. Okay, I'll share the link to that one also. And she has written a book called... Uh, visual language for designers which presents visual design principles based on cognitive science okay and she's done much much more and 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 those I think we have quite a few people even IMU that subscribes to her blog uh, and and benefit from all the resources and she's exceptional instructional designer or maybe she's a learning designer I don't know how to define her but she's known as the e-learning coach and we hope to get coached today about how to do exceptional graphics that emotionally stimulating and they, they, they look at it once and they remember the content straight away. That would be amazing. If it, I'm not sure if that's possible, but we can learn a lot from uh, masterminding our graphic design and so on to tailor to the teaching and learning process. So I will I will disappear now and I'll leave it to the e-learning coach. She, she will not be visually here, but she will be, in terms of auditory, she'll be here, but, but narration, but uh, her picture will not be here if you're looking for the picture. But that, that should be fine because uh, we'll be inspired by definitely by the, her slides and so on. So I'm going to disappear now. And I'll leave it to the one and only, the e-learning coach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Should, should I be seeing the uh, slides? Oh, there they are. <laughs> it's pretty exciting to be talking to. I know some of you are halfway around the world from me and I just love having a global consciousness, so I just think it's awesome. Can we have the first poll? See, he thought he was going to disappear, but I already have some work for him to do. There we go. I wondered what your involvement is with graphics, so I know who I'm talking to, to you. Do you uh, select graphics or create um for slides or distance learning or online learning? Do you create graphics in PowerPoint or other tools? Or are you just completely allergic to graphics and don't want to have anything to do with them? Please answer and Zaid will give us the results. Okay, I'm back, but I'll wait with the results for a while because we still only out of the 16 I hear we only have seven that has participated. So let's try to get at least 80% okay, here. They want to get okay. a big grade on this, don't they? They have to participate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, participation marks. Huh? Uh, there's no crime in 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 participating. Huh? Yeah. Okay, but we can at least we got here more than 50%. So that's okay. That's good. That's good. Uh, did I participate? Let me participate. Uh, can I just participate also myself? Can Please. I participate? Okay. I, uh, uh, what is it? Okay. So let's go back to results. And okay. The problem with WSEQ is, is, as far as I know, I, I don't know how to publish results unless I do screen sharing. But that sometimes messes up the present. I mean, the bandwidth issue and so on. So what I'm going to reveal the results like. Uh, like in a secret, but I will be honest. Okay, at the moment we have out of 17, we have uh, 12 votes. Okay, so out of the 12 votes, seven basically say I create graphics in PowerPoint or other tools. Cool. Uh, and then the other five of the 12 say I select graphics for slides or distance learning. Okay, uh, there's still people coming in. Uh, we have 12 votes. Can we have some more votes? Can we have a bit few more votes? Let's get, let's show the power of voting. Eh? In a, in a during, during election, we usually have uh, what 50 percent, 60 percent beyond the <laughs> uh, normal election. Okay, let's get. Can we get a couple of more votes? Okay, nobody. We got 19 here. We got 12 votes. 
but that's including, so we should have another, okay, okay, we got 13 votes, one listen, okay. So basically, no one voted for the, for the first option, which is, I select graphics uh, for slides or distance learning, okay. Based on the vote, or votes, uh, more majority or, or eight out of 13 that voted uh, create graphics in PowerPoint or the tools. Now it's nine, okay, now it's changing again. Okay. Okay, we have nine out of 15 that create graphics in PowerPoint or the tools, and then we have six out of 15 that actually select graphics for slides or distance learning. Okay, and no one is allergic okay. to graphics. And that, I, I don't, nobody's allergic to graphics, okay, yeah, that's, can, that's the thing. Then everyone uh, can stay, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we will. I will close the poll now, unless there's somebody eager to participate. People are still coming in. Okay, I'm going to end the poll, but we we can do the poll again later when 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 you have more people. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Okay, I'll disappear again. Oh, we got another vote. Okay, <laughs> ten. Okay, let's end the poll. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can do it again. Okay, I'm going to disappear again. Thank you. You know, visuals are so powerful that they can turn this statement, neglected children are made to feel invisible, into a persuasive appeal to eradicate, eradicate child neglect. That's because visuals persuade. Visuals are so powerful, they show you things that are invisible, things that can't be seen without a telescope or microscope, or things that we can only imagine. Visuals show hidden information. Visuals are so powerful, Florence Nightingale discovered by visualizing statistics that deaths from preventable diseases were greater than deaths from wounds during the Crimean War. And she was able to convince Queen Victoria, because of this evidence, to improve the sanitary conditions in military hospitals. Visuals solve problems. Visuals are so powerful that this plaque was placed on two Pioneer spacecrafts in the 1970s. Scientists knew if there were any hope of communicating with other beings, pictures would be the best way to do it, because visuals transcend language. Visuals are so powerful, we use them to better understand difficult subjects. For example, in this illustration uh, on the BBC site, they used visuals to explain how the nuclear disaster happened. Visuals explain. Without those kinds of illustrations, it would be very difficult to understand. Visuals are so powerful, we use them to understand huge amounts of data and to think about things in new ways. For example, this site on the BBC called How Big Really, it's the Dimension site, you can select all these different events and, and objects or things that have occurred and compare them in size. So in this case, it was how big is the wall of China compared to this portion of Malaysia. Visuals promote new ways of thinking. Probably not too many people have thought about something like that. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, I'm drawing from my book, Visual Language for Designers, which discusses and presents principles for creating graphics that's, that are based on cognitive psychology and our cognitive architecture. And here's the plan. First, I want to talk about how we're wired for graphics. Next, how you can speed up your message and get your communication across quickly. How to make graphics cognitively efficient so people understand them quickly again. And how to use graphics to connect through emotions. So are we ready to go? And please participate. I, I saw that a lot of people did participate in, that, in the poll, and that's great because somebody's asking me to speak a little louder. Can you hang on one second, and I will try to raise my microphone. Is anyone else having <laughs> go go? Is anyone else having trouble hearing me? I, if you can hang on one second, I will try to raise the audio level. I'm sorry about this. 
I guess you were really participating. Is this any better? Can you tell me if this is better? Yes. Okay. My voice is soothing. Okay, now let me put you to sleep, though. All right. We are going to uh, just want to please ask everyone to participate, because what I was about to say was, you know, no one here can know everything. So when you participate, but then we can all learn from each other. So thanks a lot. Now, I wanted to show you a few statements about the brain. Uh, I know we probably have a few medical people in here, so no fair if you know the answer, but that's OK. Uh, we have a poll. Which of the following statements do you think is true? We have 5 billion neurons devoted to visual processing. Humans have 10 billion neurons, or an estimated 20 billion neurons devoted to visual processing. Why don't you take a guess? And then click Submit. And Zaid will let us know uh, how people have answered. OK, hi, I'm back here. <laughs> OK, 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 let's just. Uh, how are they doing? Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get this up. And on. OK, they're doing quite well. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see what they have done here, OK? Uh, should we wait a bit more? We have 15 out of 21 that has voted here. so. 22 now, so let's just get a few more votes. Can we get a few more votes? Uh, even the presenter can also vote, <laughs> but she knows the answer, so that's not a good idea. Okay, uh, okay. The, until now, we have um, we have the majority has actually got the right answer, and I don't know if that is intuition or actually they know the facts. Okay, but basically, uh, let's say in six of you. Okay, it's people, or not people changing the answer? Or is some, okay. okay, six of you until now has got it wrong based on what I know is the right answer. And uh, those six are actually, I'm not going to mention names because I don't know who it is, but <laughs> uh, 10 billion is not the answer. So what is the answer? Okay, it's not 10 billion. Six of you voted for 10 billion, so that's not the answer. And how many so what is the right answer? Well, and the majority, has, yeah, and actually the, and the right answer is, 20 billion, and actually 10 of you voted for that. 10 out of 16 voted for the correct, and now somebody's voting for the wrong answer after, <laughs> after I revealed the answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, it's not 5 billion neurons. It's not 10 billion neurons. It's actually 20 billion neurons devoted to visual processing, and the majority of us got it right. All right. So that's, we have to clap for ourselves. Now. We're very good. Yeah, we're great. Okay. <laughs> I'm out of here. Right, I shouldn't have revealed the result there so early. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Okay, I'm going to disappear. And, okay. Now, I was going to not even tell you the answer and say, pay attention and you'll, you'll see. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to start out by saying that our brains are completely hardwired for graphics. And if you look at the capabilities of the brain, you'll understand and how we process, uh, handle and process and perceive and for, you know, visual information. It really helps you to understand how important graphics are in any kind of learning situation, and you'll see why. First of all, there are more brain resources devoted to vision than to any other sense, and there are 20 billion neurons. The slide got a little messed up uh, going from uh, here to there, but that's okay. You get the idea. So that's, that's an estimated 20 billion neurons are devoted to visual processing more than any other sense. And just for comparison, the fiber optic nerve that goes from that runs from the brain to the eye has 1,200,000 fibers, and the auditory nerve only has 30,000 fibers. So look at the difference. And as a result, or probably as a result, we have something called the, a phenomenon called the picture super, superiority effect. We have a better memory for pictures than words, and what that means is. If you were explaining how this solar emergency system works, people would remember it much better if you explained it through a graphic than through text alone. And actually, the best combination is graphics and text together. And it makes sense that 
were visual creatures because when you think about how we evolved, what was going on in the environment was so important to survival. And pictures are a closer replica of the environment than our words. You might be wondering, what is a mental image? Well, it's a form of internal representation that preserves the physical characteristics of what it represents. And that's a little bit of a convoluted idea. So let's see what we mean. If you look at a cat, and you see a cat walking down the street, and you get home, and you if you're a, a, um, obsessed about cats like I am, you might say to yourself, wow, I wonder if that little kitty has a home. And when you stop and think about the kitten, this might be how you remember it. You're actually preserving some of the physical characteristics in your brain. You might remember the general shape. You might remember some of the colors. You, you probably won't remember every single detail. But in some way, you'll have a mental image that preserves the physical characteristics. Did I skip something? No. Let's talk a little bit about the information processing model that is how we perceive and process this information. And I'm really sorry that it looks like the slides are getting a little bit messed up in WizIQ, but I think everyone here can still make the best of it. So there are, in this information processing model, which is kind of the basis for cognitive psychology, the model more or less works pretty well. And, and here's how it works in the simplified version, that there are three, they say there are three memory stores, your sensory memory, your working memory, and your long-term memory. So you think in terms of visual and auditory information, really all of your sensory information. But when it comes to learning, we tend to think in terms of visual and auditory. So all of your information is still coming into your sensory memory. And it's something like, I heard recently, 11 million set bits of information a day. And if we didn't have some way to funnel that, we would just be stuck in our chairs. We wouldn't even be able to get up and move. We'd be so overwhelmed. So this information gets funneled into working memory. Working memory is what they used to call short-term memory. But now we know that working memory is essentially what you do when you're manipulating information, um, we call it being online. It's like being online in your brain. It's the space in your mind where you're just manipulating information. And a small portion of that goes into long-term memory. So a very little bit of the information gets, is getting encoded into long-term memory. Now, working memory definitely has some problems with it in terms of learning. It limits the information we process. It, it has a very limited capacity, possibly four to five bits of information. That means that a learner can hold maybe four to five bits of information in his or her working memory at one time. They used to say seven plus or minus two, but the latest research is showing that it's quite a bit less than that. And things in working memory last just for a few seconds. And that's why uh, when someone tells you their phone number, you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, because things only last a few seconds. And if you don't write it down or put it into your cell phone, then you will no longer remember it. It just vanishes. But long-term memory, on the other hand, especially long-term memory for pictures, is really amazing. They have given people all kinds of tests where they showed them something like 2,000 graphics, 2,000 pictures. And even up to a few weeks later, the majority of people could remember 90% of them. So we have an amazing long-term memory for pictures. And I'm wondering if any of you have had that experience where you look at an old, old photo album, one that you haven't seen in many years. And you remember all the pictures that were in there. They all look familiar to you. I'm sorry if people are having trouble uh, not hearing. I see we're getting that message. I don't know if that's something you can do on your end, Zaid. So what are the main points about 
visual design and learning from pictures and really all kinds of learning is to remember that people give meaning to the visuals that they process. They bring in their expectations, their cultural beliefs, their educational level influences it. So when you show someone a visual, each person, each learner might be interpreting it differently. That's important to keep in mind. And this very well-known cognitive psychologist Stephen Coslin says, the mind is not a camera. Where people aren't just out there recording and recording and recording as though they're a camera. Instead, people are filtering and remembering and perceiving just what they are attending to. And then their perceptions change everything. So people put their own meanings on all the visuals that you show. And of course, graphics can fail. This was a famous PowerPoint slide that was uh, all around the internet several years ago. And it was supposed to be the American uh, strategy for the war in Afghanistan. And it became a joke because it was so confusing. It was just a bunch of spaghetti. So these are the kinds of graphics that just drive people crazy and that people can't make sense of. And that's why I really like research-inspired design, because it's based on findings and evidence, and it considers how people perceive and comprehend visual information, and it can be applied to the real world. And, that's, and those are the principles that we're going to talk about today. So let me ask you a question, and here you can just answer in chat. And at one point, I thought that most of the audience uh, was part of the uh, medical university. So some of these questions are very medical oriented. So um, sorry if they seem a little confusing to you. But imagine you're making a slide or an e-learning course for a medical presentation. And you want one body system, such as the digestive system, to immediately stand out to the learner. What do you think the best way to do that is? I'd like to hear your ideas. Answer in chat. OK. Now these are very good. Jasmine said circle the body part. That would draw the eyes to it. Someone else suggests do it part by part. Show a whole picture, zoom in and zoom out, animate the body system and zoom in. These are all great answers. This is why it's important for everyone to participate, because you'll get some ideas. Let me see if there are any more. OK, add animation. All right, now I'm going to show you something called a, a way to speed up your message, a way that you can get your message across very quickly. And circling the body part and zooming in are all, also other ways that you can get your message across quickly. There's something that all humans do called pre-attentive processing. And it happens, it happens before we are even conscious of it. And that's why it's pre-attentive. And what we're doing is we're scanning the environment for things that pop out, for things that are important to us. Imagine being in a less, you know, being alive hundreds or thousands of years ago when perhaps the world was more dangerous. And you had to always be scanning the environment, looking for anything important, any danger, or noticing whether someone was your friend. So we have this unconscious process. And by doing pre-attentive processing, people notice what pops out, and they notice what things are grouped together. And this provides unconscious meaning and tells us what we should be paying attention to. So the features that pop out are the primitive features in your visual environment. And we're going to go over what some of these are, are. And you can take these and use these in your own visuals. And if you don't create visuals, if you're just looking for visuals, or if you work with an artist, you can help them. You can ensure that these kinds of things are in the graphics when you want to get a message across quickly. So you use pop out to build a visual hierarchy. And a visual hierarchy 
refers to the way someone will look at something first and then what to look at second and when then what to look at third. And you want to consciously build, intentionally build a visual hierarchy in your graphics. So in the chat window, why don't you tell me what attribute, what characteristic of this graphic did you notice first? Write it in the chat window. Anyone typing there? Yep, people saw red and they saw color. Of course, the red puzzle piece, of course. So color is one of the first primary things that people will notice and that really pops out unconsciously. Here, imagine you wanted to tell a story about a particular individual who was unique and different than everyone else. <laughs> Crocs. The, the color stands out and the difference. You'll notice this on websites all the time. When they want you to click a particular button, they'll put in a very bright color. Now, what about in this graphic? What characteristic do you think they're trying to make, uh, are they using to make something stand out? The size, right. So size is a second primary visual attribute that pops out at people. Right away, people notice size. So if you want learners to notice something, you can make it larger. In this graphic, my eye is drawn completely to the first to the largest graphics. This is an information graphic about the value of an hour of work. And you'll notice that in advertisements. They make what you want what they want you to notice will be the largest thing on the screen. Now this one is a little bit hard to get, but one of the other visual attributes is shape. Of course, they're also using size. You can use make your shapes really stand out, and that also will be something that people will notice quickly, pre-attentively. Again, here's another information graphic. The only thing is I've forgotten what it represents. But the shapes are unusual, and they stand out quickly. And of course, the colors do too, and that's one good thing to keep in mind. Someone thinks this graphic is too busy. That's one of the things that you can keep in mind, is that you can combine some of these traits. You can combine color, size, and shape. And, and you will certainly get someone to notice it quickly. What do you think this one is? What characteristic makes you notice something here? Direction. Someone is saying bold first. It's not supposed to be <laughs> bold there. Direction, yes. And in uh, cognitive psychology terms, they call it orientation. So orientation, when an object is oriented differently than other objects, people will notice that right away. And you can also do that with people. Maybe you want to say this young man has a different opinion than everyone else. So you can also orient your people differently. And finally, what do you think they're trying to show here besides the red arrow? Because we know the color can pop out. <laughs> Suicide. <laughs> what characteristic would you notice? Eh, it might be a little bit hard to get. Don't follow the crowd, okay. You do notice the, the little man, right? The little the little being there. And what the characteristic is is motion. Do you ever go to a website where you see one of those horrible little GIF animations going back and forth and back and forth and you just can't take your eye off of it? That's because motion is one of the primary characteristics that people notice in pre-attentive processing. It's very difficult to ignore. And the amazingly cool and fascinating thing about our brains is that even when something looks like it's moving, it lights up those centers of our brain that detect motion. So whenever we see something still, if it looks like it's moving, we are simulating movement in our brain. And here's another example. It doesn't even have to be people or animals moving. 
it looks to me this looks like the yellow slice of the pie chart is kind of coming out and even that amount of movement would work and if you want to and if you wanted to combine characteristics you would make the one that you wanted to show the 10% you would make that one red and then it would even stand out more so the features that pop out just to review, because I know working memory can only hold four bits of information. Color, size, shape, orientation, and movement. And again, I apologize if there's some overlapping or the graphics look a little funny. It's WizIQ's fault. Right, Zaid? It, it used to look good. So these are, the, these are the features that pop out. And hopefully, you'll remember this or you're writing them down, because uh, you'll be amazed at how much this can help your visuals and how, how quickly you can get the message across if you haven't been using this already. Just don't use animated GIFs. Now the other thing is, the other characteristic that can get things across uh, perceived quickly is grouping. And these are the perceptual conditions that force us to see parts as one unit. Perceptual grouping, many of these uh, perceptual grouping techniques were discovered by psychologists in the 1920s. So many of the things that they discovered in the 1920s are still true, the Gestalt psychologists. Let's look at some of these. Yes, I did want to say this too, that you can use grouping to create meaning. And interestingly, the opposite works. If you accidentally have things grouped together, people will get the wrong idea and think that there's, that there's some relationship going on between the elements. So let's look at some examples. Proximity is one of the conditions that automatically makes us perceive things in groups. So if you have some elements close together, in this case, it's an information graphic about who washes their hands by activity and by location. And most likely, you perceive all of the elements on the left as one group because they're close together, and all of the elements on the right as, one, as another group because they're close together. So proximity is one way that you can help learners understand something in a graphic by, by creating grouping perceptually. And you'll see that all over the place on websites. We just take it for granted. But here's a website, and we imagine that the elements going across the top are grouped together, that they are in, in one parallel, they have, they have some kind of parallel meaning, and that the elements here are together, and that the three large graphics are featured items. So we group things all the time, naturally. This is a, an information graphic that shows how much, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is the US, it shows which drugs are used, the percentage of drugs that are pharmaceuticals are, are used. And in terms of grouping, anything that is similar in color, shape, or size, people will automatically group together. So you most likely see the red pills as one group, the green pills as a group, and so forth and so on. And I wanted to, I love to show this graphic because it's such an easy way, instead of using text, always using text on the screen or in slides or in job aids, it's such an easy way to show percentages. And here we've got 74% in blue circles and 74% in pink circles. And then at the bottom, you can see them grouped together. And because they're similar circles, you will group them together. And they also have proximity. And anyone, even if you have zero uh, graphic abilities, you can make something like this in PowerPoint very easily. Now, this is an interesting Gestalt rule. And it's called common fate. And what it says is that elements that are going in the same direction will be grouped together also. So you most likely see all the elements on the right as one group. And you've also got uh, 
you've also got them in, in close proximity. But this is called common fate. So anytime you have elements moving in the same direction, it looks like they're group. They're going to be grouped together. That's uh, it's a little bit of a um, unusual one, but it also works. Now here are two more recent perceptual grouping rules that have been discovered in more recent times. And one is connectedness. And that says that if graphics or visual elements have lines between them, we perceive them as one group. And in this, uh, in this information graphic that explains how VOIP voice service works, we see it as one big diagram because everything's connected in groups. And also, here's, here's just a little design tip. Instead of using boxes in your diagrams, if you can just get small icons or illustrations from a stock photo site or have an artist draw them, or just little bits of clip art, it makes a diagram much more interesting and it gives it more meaning than if it were just a box with, with text inside. And here's another example of a diagram with lines that show connectedness. We group them together when, when, they're connect, when elements are connected. And finally, boundaries. When elements have boundaries around them, we tend to group the things within the boundary. This is an example of a showing how, how much uh, people use the internet, how much they're online or on their computers from Wired Magazine. And we tend to separate each floor because of the boundary principle. And you also will find that in maps. Because of boundaries, that's how you separate districts or states or territories. So a lot of these things we take for granted, but you can take these rules and use them in your graphics. It's kind of like bringing them into awareness and consciousness, so you can use them. So the conditions for perceiving parts as a group or proximity, when things are close together, learners will perceive them as a group. When you use similar elements, when things are going in the same direction, common fate. When elements are connected by lines, and when there's a boundary circling the elements, you'll see those, people will perceive those as a group. Now here's a chat question for you for the next section. You're looking for a graphic of the lungs for a pulmonary lecture. What is the best way to portray the lungs? Do you think the best way would be to have a photograph of a dis you know, a dissection photograph of a lung or an illustration? Photograph or illustration? Or you can think of it in terms of a car engine. If you're teaching someone about car engines, would it be best to show a photograph of the car engine or the illustration? Answer in chat. OK, so we're getting some interesting answers. Some people think the photograph. Some people think the illustration because it's simpler. Well, let's go into this next principle and see what you think. We're going to talk about ways to make visuals cognitively efficient, because when they're efficient, people will remember them. People will process the information more easily and will be more likely to store the information. And one of the main ways that you can make graphics cognitively efficient is to reduce the realism in them, which means that in that last uh, question, the illustration, is particularly for novice learners, would be most likely would be more clear to them than a photograph, which has more complex visual cues. So reducing the realism makes graphics cognitively efficient. They provide, they provide fewer distractions. If you reduce realism, it takes less time for the learner to perceive it. It minimizes the load on working memory. And it's easier to encode the information into long-term memory. 
Let's look at a few examples. This is a fairly realistic, I believe it's a photograph. It could be amazing 3D. And this one has a lot less realism. In the chat window, what do you think is the difference? Why would we say the one at the bottom is less realistic? What do you think are the differences between the two? These are great answers. There's less color, and the color is not realistic. It's less messy. The bottom one has less detail. There's not much dimensionality. There's more contrast, less realistic color. And there are fewer colors, too. Actually, to tell you the truth, in this one, I'm not sure. But generally, there are. <laughs> I love the above one. So. You're right on target there for understanding the difference between uh, 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 or for ways to reduce realism. And look at this one. It's fascinating the way our brains work. That we still, even in this very minimalist graphic, it still says city to us. And that's because the brain will fill in missing information. That's, that's an amazing thing for all learning experience designers to remember that the brain will fill in missing information. So you, you don't have to worry about using minimalist graphics. And let's look at a few examples. Minimalist graphics have fewer colors, less detail, smoother surfaces. They're kind of flat. And they have minimal shadows. There's not as much shading. Now when you look at that at this graphic here, we see a map, and we see people in business attire. You tend to think, perhaps, global business. Is that what you thought? You, you get some sense of global business. Now, isn't that amazing that the brain can pick up on that? And that's because people are visually literate. Where there are a few visual cues. You see a suit and tie. You see a map. And you think it must be some kind of international business. So minimalist graphics work. One level down in minimalist graphics are silhouettes. This is this came from an information graphic about Michelle Obama, about how whatever she wears in the United States, people go out and buy. So she ends up um, affecting the fashion industry. And when I, you know, if you're not from the United States, you might not have thought this, but for someone who lives in the states. As soon as I saw this graphic, I knew it was Michelle Obama. And look at how simple it is. Now, normally, a silhouette even has fewer visual cues than this. It's just really a flat area that's outlined and filled with, often with just one color. And yet, silhouettes will still get your idea across. They're great to use in visual design. Let's look at a few examples. Here in this information graphic, if you really know your uh, geography, you might be able to recognize the silhouettes in this map. If you wanted to learn about leaves, using silhouettes would be great. The next level down is line art. Line art has not, usually doesn't have much inside. It's often just in black and white. And yet, look at this graphic. We can perfectly perceive it. And not only that, it's probably better if they were teaching, someone is teaching how to measure a child. It shows the four points on the body where the child's body should touch the vertical pole. And this is probably more clear than a photograph, because there are fewer visual cues, and you can see exactly where the arrows are pointing. So don't hesitate to use line art. And if you can use Photoshop, it's very easy to just put your graphic down if you have a photograph of something and to just make your put a layer above it, make it somewhat uh, less opaque, and, and trace it. And I thought this was a kind of brilliant 
uh, graphic done in line art, and it's by Nigel Holmes, and he allowed me to put it in my book, and I was just so excited to get it, and when he first sent it to me, he's a very famous uh, illustrator and information graphic artist in the United States. And when he first sent it to me, I didn't get it. And it took me about 10 minutes. OK, maybe I'm a little bit slow. But it took me about 10 minutes to get it. And what it is, is the protocols of kissing in different places of the world. So in France, you've got the ki two kisses on the cheek. In Russia, you've got the kiss on the lips. This is how people are supposed to greet each other. In Holland. It's the three kiss, cheek, cheek, cheek. And in New York, it's the air kiss. <laughs> so does anyone else think this is really funny? Because I thought it was very funny. And, and, and pretty smart, because without using any words, he was able to express all of that. <laughs> I thought it was a brilliant visual, too, especially because it took me so long to get it. When I got it, I laughed out loud. Now, here's another one by Nigel Holmes, and it is how to tie a scarf. Again, no words. He has an entire book. <laughs> he has an entire book of visuals with no words. You can find that on Amazon. It's just a few dollars. See, people did like the graphic. OK, that's great. Now, even at a lower level or at a reduced level, of line art are iconic graphics. And I thought this was a pretty brilliant, brilliant one. All it does is show nine coffee cups. And by doing that, it's able to use each coffee cup as a graph. And it shows the percentage or the ratio of ingredients in, all the, in these nine different drinks. Very simple, very clear. And I thought this was also pretty brilliant. So iconic graphics really reduce realism where it's just a hint, the most simplest hint of what the object is. And here's another example of that. And yet we can recognize nearly all, all of these graphics, the CD. And this information graphic is about things that have actually gotten less expensive over the years. And here are some medical icons for any medical people in the audience. Again, we can understand what most of these are, if not all of them. That little green blob, I believe, is supposed to be a virus. Just look at what the brain does. Look at how quickly we can recognize and understand iconic forms. So don't forget to use icons. And you know, icons, I use them a lot in menus and also to categorize information. So icons are great to use. And they also, if you just want to say one quick thing, it's very simple to find these little little men or little people. And you just color one in, and bam, you've got your, you can get your point across very quickly. And finally, symbols. Now, symbols are very simplistic graphics, but they don't represent any item. They just have to be learned. Now, for example, most visually literate people know that X means wrong and a check mark means correct, at least in certain countries. I'm not sure what it means everywhere around the world. And context is often a very key ingredient to a symbol. For example, this can mean this symbol can mean wireless. And this can also mean wireless. And yet when you see that same symbol in an orange box, if you're computer literate, you know that that means an RSS feed. So context is often a key ingredient in understanding symbols. So to make graphics cognitively efficient, that means people will be able to process them quickly and are more likely to be able to encode them because they have fewer visual cues. You want to reduce realism, and you can use silhouettes, line art, iconic forms, and symbols. I hope everybody uh, got something out of that. Are there any comments or questions about any of this so far? 
We have one more topic to go through, and then I was going to uh, get into some top uh, questions and discussions. But if you've had, an, had anything to say now about reducing realism, go ahead. Someone just said, no questions, but it's interesting. OK, that's great. Can you name one way that you could use an emotional graphic to engage an audience? Answer in the chat window. What's one way you can use an emotional graphic to engage your audience? Now that's hard. Smileys, open with a joke. OK, that's true. You could open with something humorous. That would get people in the right mood. <laughs> Anything else? I want a color. Yeah, color is highly tied to emotion. A poll, right? That's a way to get your, get your audience engaged, although it's not exactly, well, it could be emotional, I guess. <laughs> Showing facial expressions, yes. That certainly uh, conveys emotion. In fact, <laughs> I want to show you a few. An emotional video could work. Let me show you a few graphics. And these are emotional graphics. And see if they have any visceral effect on you. Here we go. Watch these graphics. And notice if you're getting any, if you have any kind of a sensation when you look at each of these faces. See how much graphics affect you, how much emotional graphics affect you. If any of these affected you, why don't you write which one? Which one that might have caused a, a, a visceral reaction, even in your body? The baby. <laughs> Someone said all of them. The last one. Mm -hmm. You know what's so funny? It's sometimes when I give this uh, talk to an audience and I put a, and there's a picture of a pet, everyone goes, oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, something in the United States or what. Anyway, yes, emotions you can see are a great way to connect with your audience. They move people. They're visceral. <laughs> You're like cats, Lola. <laughs> funny. And it's interesting because at one time there's, there's this history that we have of a, or a scientific idea that emotion and cognition are two completely independent phenomena of the brain. But all the research now shows that emotion and cognition are completely interdependent on each other and that we make decisions, cognitive decisions based on emotion and that emotion is influenced by our cognitive thoughts. So the two are completely independent. It's very difficult to separate them. And that's important to know in learning because someone's emotions, their motivation, highly affects how well they learn. Emotions affect many mental processes. They can capture someone's attention. They increase brain activity over and over and over again. Researchers in these experiments would show people emotional graphics. And no matter how many times the people saw the graphics, it still increased their brain activity. And it can improve retention because people will associate emotions with a particular idea or concept. And a few people here mentioned faces, and it's really true. We are particularly attuned to faces. There are several different parts of the brain that process facial information. And that makes perfect sense because it makes, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the funny comment there. It makes perfect sense that we would be so attuned to faces because think of all the information that's in them. First of all, we want to know, particularly in uh, times past, but possibly even today, whether someone is a, a friend or foe, 
or are you in danger? So that's one part of the brain that's processing it. Another part of the brain is processing, do I know this person? Who is this? Do I recognize this person? And then another part of the brain is processing the visual cues on the person's face. Is this person angry? Is this person happy? How should I react to this person? So there's so much information that's just loaded into, uh, into the face and how we process and perceive it. And even cartoonish faces we can react to. Look at these different expressions here, and they actually will have an effect on you, and it's, and it's just a drawing. And this is a sample from a textbook on, that teaches people management, and the entire, it's a college level textbook, and the entire thing is all done in graphics and in illustration, some comic book style, and when you look at the pictures, you can see how engaging it is. There are all kinds of emotional expressions there, and it's a very popular textbook when professors have been using it in class. Emotional images are very effective for changing attitudes. Look at this simple graphic to stop smoking. The cigarette is being put out on the word health. Bam, you get the message. Same thing in this case. You automatically know before looking at the data that this poster is against using coal to he for heating because it's so polluting. And if the same poster had green rolling hills and a blue sky and a big yellow sun, you would know that they were taking the statistics, flipping them around, and giving you another message. And there's another side to emotion. Oh, one other thing I want to say about this. This shows that you can, you can use imagery that doesn't have anything to do with a person and still get an emotion across, still communicate an emotion to your audience, because no one likes pollution. And there's another side to emotion that someone mentioned about saying something humorous or funny, and it's surprise. You can surprise learners by using silly and humorous graphics. You can get their attention because surprise results from novelty or humor or from the unusual juxtaposition of events and elements and from something unexpected. You don't expect to walk into the office and see someone drinking out of the coffee pot. So this is one great way to use emotion the emotion of surprise to get your audience's attention. Here's another one done by uh, a French uh, ad agency. I don't know if you can remember being a child and it felt like your cheeks were just getting pulled all the way out when somebody was pinching your cheeks. Just a horrible feeling. So much of what it has to do with fries, but it's another humorous graphic. Anyway, I wanted to say thank you. Uh, it was great having all everyone participate. If you would like to continue, you know, communicate with me, you can go to my site, the eLearningCoach.com, and I have a contact form there. You can sign up for my newsletter if you want to get something uh, twice a month with uh, articles and resource links. And I just wanted to hear if anyone has any comments or anything you wanted to say or questions. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to be talking to people halfway around the planet. Warms my heart. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to spoil the party here, but uh, uh, before before we go into the question, also I want to thank you very much for doing this presentation. And uh, I'm not sure, are you going to make the slides available on SlideShare, or then I can just link it in the blog, or, or is that going to be uh, kind of not shared publicly, the slides? Because I noticed you, you share your slides on SlideShare. Are you going to make it available there, so I can just link it in the in the blog post? I might be able to share them. Oh, I can show the old one, no problem. No, no, that's a that's a totally different. Person. Yeah, because it will actually. I don't know if it makes sense, but because there's there's so little 
text, but I, I can do that. I, I'll give it to you as a PDF because I'm really not allowed to distribute uh, the graphic. You know, some of these graphics I'm not allowed to distribute. So uh, let me see. Okay, then then don't. But okay, but it, yeah. I, I will give it to you as a PDF. But file. but you don't mind that we make this away. Okay. No, yeah, but uh, if you upload yourself to slideshow, we better. We just I will just basically uh, embed it in the in the blog post. If that's possible, then you don't have to worry. Okay, well we can it, talk about Then you can it manage it easier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So no problem. Is there any questions or not? Yeah, I see a question about copyrights. <sighs> okay. Uh, yeah, you. Yeah, how to deal with copyright? Where? <laughs> I, I think you really, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I really try to be careful of dealing with copyrights. Give the appropriate attribution. Um, get things from stock photo sites where it's already been cleared. That's the safest thing you can do, or you have to start. Do, do, Go ahead. No, there was one. I, I was on quote. I, I quoted yesterday. Was it? If you co copy by one author, it's considered plagiarism. If you copy by two, it's considered research. <laughs> but I was just wondering how 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 because I mean even I know I work with a lot of graphic designers. Many of them they take like from four or five images and they mash them up and they have their own graphic. And and many uh, publishers don't realize that's what they've done. <laughs> you know. So how do you have you come across any rules or, or guidance on where what is allowed, what is not allowed in terms of um, uh, mixing graphics and and mashing them up and so on? Is there any Clear rules, or there's no clear rules in in US. How strict are they? You know, because when you go to Google Image Search, you have like tons of interesting images, and a lot of people have are very tempted to actually just copy paste them in their slides, even out without giving it recognition of links. Can you share something on that from your experience working in the industry? Sure. Well, I'm guessing that the laws in every country are different. I did hear quite a while ago, so I don't know if it's still true, that there was a certain percentage that if you change a graphic by X percentage, you know, that it's okay. Certainly if you change a graphic, take four or five, mash it up so that you can't recognize the original graphic, well, you know, maybe that's okay, I don't know. Yeah. You know I'll give you an example. Go ahead. I'll give you an example. I have I have an image here. It, it looks, it's a real picture, and what I do is I use uh, PowerPoint artifacts and somebody becomes a drawing because you can convert a picture to drawing. Mm -hmm. So, are you breaking any copyright law by taking the graphic and <laughs> converting using artifact one-click artifacts, and and you have a drawing or you have maybe a, a cartoonish look like of the same original picture? I have yet to see anybody actually make any uh, comments regarding that, and you know, because uh, of course, obviously, if you copy straight from a book or you scan it, I, I think the most common practice by academicians is actually. They go to the book and they actually scan the picture and, and then they crop it and they put it into their slides. And that's a very common practice. I mean, I've, all universities I mean, is, is a common practice. But as long as you put referencing or you write to the book, it's not a problem. But sometimes they don't do that. So, what, what in terms of the professional field, uh, what do you have to do to clear your graphics or you don't clear your graphics? How does that work? Have you experienced that they actually had publishers going after you regarding some graphics? No, I have. Maybe your colleagues. But because I, I I haven't, but because I always work as a consultant, I always work for other organizations and companies. I try to be pretty very strict about it because I don't want to get any any of them in trouble. Uh, because of my, you know, it's my fault. I would think that as a university, you, uh, many textbook authors would allow you, or publishers would, al if you asked permission and said it was for educational purposes, that they might let you use their graphics. I, I always ask. I try to be uh, yeah. above board all the time. Because also, artists want to get. Yeah, I just give some advice for the. Yeah. Well, I think they better go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't feel like I, you know, have enough legal knowledge to know. I just know that I try to stay above board. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's safe. You know, I just try to be safe, you know. Oh, okay. Okay, I just want to give uh, some recommendation to the the viewers or the participants here. Is actually, if 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 you want to copy from a book, I mean, especially if you're McGraw Hill or and you're just using it for education purpose, the best way to do it is actually uh, you go to the web companion because most books have actually a website to support the book, and very often they have actually slides to represent each chapter, and most of the images that you want are actually in those slides that you can actually reuse for education purposes and so on. So that's one way of getting those images without necessarily to go and actually scan the book. You know, because uh, a lot of people they like to scan a book, but the images are already made available on the book's uh, website and so on. So that's one way to get hold of the graphics if you're just using it for educational purpose. The moment if you want to sell your product, then you you have to really do some uh, clearance of the graphics. That's far as I know. I'm not an expert, but that's my experience. Mm -hmm. 
I but a lot of teachers don't know that books have a website. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I would like to answer Jasmine's question uh, before it scrolls by. She says she teaches restaurant service and was wondering if still pictures work better or video for effectiveness. And pretty much a rule of thumb is if you need to show movement, if you need to show uh, how someone is doing something, you know, a procedure where the movement is important, then you would want to show video. If you have a story going on, you know, and some acting, obviously you'd use video. Um, Sometimes if you if a procedure is hard to learn though, you might want to break it up into stills and number them, you know, one, two, three, four, five to show it. So I think you just have to put yourself in the learner's place and possibly interview a few learners and it, you know, there's no one answer. It really depends on what you're teaching. I just wanted to make sure uh, I got that in there before it scrolled by. Okay, can I ask you, uh, in now in today's instructional designers, are they expected actually to, to also create the graphics? Because now, because of the tools, right, rapid e-learning tools, they can they can basically do, avoid much of the programming. And I, I notice a lot of people are becoming, they call them learning designers. They actually do basically most of the things except for the really exceptional simulations and so on. What is your experience in the field now? Is it expected from instructional designers to actually also do the basic graphics also? by reusing from repositories and so on. Right. My experience is that uh, there are a lot of small teams, like one person, uh, you know, one person, a solo team, because that, because e-learning is becoming so mainstream that often there's just one person in a company who, who's expected to do everything. And in those situations, yes, they are expected to be able to at least select and edit the graphics. You know, and usually it's only going to be photographs or clip art. And then in the larger companies that have larger teams, they'll have individual graphic designers and illustrators. So I, I think it depends on what situation you're working in. And I'd like to share one more link. Eh? Uh, you have that your you have your resource page on your e-learning coach blog. There's a lot of interesting resources uh, resources there. Uh, you know, there was a lot. I found a lot there interesting. Uh, let's see. You know the one that, what they have? You know just to mention your blog. Okay, you know what's amazing? In on the <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry. The resources that are there. Uh, there's one resource for storyboards, and there have been 25,000 downloads of story. You know, free storyboard templates. 25,000. That is just wild. So, <laughs> people really yeah. want the storyboard templates. That shows that we still have. <laughs> I posted the link, by the way. I just posted the link. Is that the storyboard depot, right? Yeah. Yeah, I shared the link. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'll be the world to 25,001. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what people look for. Yeah, even I, I notice things like Bloom's Taxonomy. If you write on Bloom's Taxonomy, people are still dying to get hold of the Bloom's Taxonomy, anything on Bloom's Taxonomy, and especially like storyboards and, and particular graphic design. Yeah. That's great, but I, I will definitely share your resource in your blog, because your resource site is, is a lot of your, what you've done and also collections of what other people have done, which is very useful. Right. Uh, is there anything else you want to share regarding your blog? That, like, when people go to your blog, where should they go? What is the pop-out feature that you want them to go to? Well, the bot to get started with your blog. The first menu, the one uh, there's a menu all the way at the top, but the second menu, the the one that's uh, going across. You know, it says it has e-learning, has instructional design, a section on cognition, a section on different media. That's where I write about graphics and video, and I can't remember what else is there. But um, there, are, I, I try to have the information there categorized to make it easier for people to find it. And I just love this field so much. There, there's so many things that you can write about and learn that I just can't stop writing. There are 180 articles on there. What about your, maybe you can just mention while some are still here, your app and your book. Um, you have an app for the iPhone. Uh, I don't think most people, I, I will share with the link and, and, and the book. What is the reception been to your app, the iPhone app? I can put the link well, here. It's interesting that you mentioned. Your iPhone app. You have an iPhone. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Bloom's Taxonomy because that was my motivation for the app. One day I was just sitting there at my desk and I uh, needed to look up Bloom, you know, one of the verbs for Bloom's Taxonomy for a design document. I thought, you know, I'm feeling so lazy. I don't even want to look it up. I just wish I had it on my phone. And that's when the, I, I conceived the idea of, okay, I'm just going to make a, a, an, an, an app for instruction designers. So it's got 470 terms that uh, have 
that an instruction designer might need to know everything from HTML to, you know, graphics to cognitive psychology to instructional design to media. And it's all in there, a very simple all-text interface. And I'm working on updating it now because in one year, it's been out for one year, in one year's time, um, we have so many new words in our field, like MOOC and gamification. And there's just so many, <laughs> happy. It's, it, it, this field just yeah. keeps changing all the time. So. And, and a SOOC, you know SOOC also, SOOC. No, what does that mean? I'll put it S-O-O-C. What does that stand for? Eh? Small open online course. A lot of people want to do the massive, but they end up with a S O O C. Small open online course. <laughs> I'm just joking. But that, that word the M, you know, it, it kills. I mean, it's, you want to launch an M, and it's only only 20. You have 20 students in your course. It doesn't fit in real so Actually, I would like to have a double O C is better, but you know, because the the M, the massive is 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 to me is a bit. Um, I understand some courses, m many of those courses with Ivy League will be MOOCs, but a lot of them, might, when we start going to the masses, it will be a SOOCs. They're just joking S for small instead of M for massive. <laughs> that, that is such a good point. Uh, I agree with you. That is a really good point. Uh, okay, and the last thing I, I, I would like to, sh okay, one more thing. Did you, how did you develop the app? How did you actually develop this app? Did you develop or you asked someone else to develop or you developed by yourself? I, I designed the user interface and I wrote the 470 words, which I would never do that again. That was, that was very difficult. <laughs> my, my husband's a programmer, so he designed the database and then I handed it over to, <laughs> to a, um, an iPhone developer. So there were many, many uh, stages of it. <laughs> it took months, really, to, to pull it all together. And the tech but was it, what is it, was it, ex uh. But was it expensive to get an an an, an iPhone uh, app developer to actually develop your your idea or your your product? Yes, it was expensive, and the app in the U.S. costs four ninety nine. And some people have complained, um, not not really complained, but one or two people have said, you know, you know, they're used to getting apps for free, but only a big business can afford to put out the money, you know, to, yeah. to to get one made. So it was several, it was a few, you know, a few thousand dollars that I had to lay out. And I'm slowly getting it back. <laughs> but, but people tell me they use it in... Okay, last question. Uh, okay, the, your book, uh, we, we, you didn't talk much about your book, you just mentioned your book. So what, um, who, who is the audience in your book? Are you targeting... Uh, the mass, or you're talking more the people involved in content development, instructional designers, and multimedia designers. Who is actually a target audience, and can it be suitable for academics to read, or is it too intensive? What do you think? I mean, what is your opinion as the author? Um, I think it. I think it's a more because it has a lot of cognitive psychology. I think it is actually, in some ways, very suitable for academics, and some people are using it in their classrooms. Uh, in you know instructional design classrooms, the audience originally w was supposed to be instructional designers, but my publisher didn't know what they those were, so it kind of morphed into a book okay. for vi for visual designers. But I was always thinking of graphic designers the whole time I was writing. I mean, instructional designers. Uh, I was thinking of them the whole time. So quite a few instructional designers have used it and said it worked for them. So I'd like to write another one that's pure. Purely for instructional designers, but this one is a mix. It's for graphic designers and instructional designers. Anyone who does visual communication. Okay. Yeah, I, I sh yeah, I think uh, visual design is so important now, and you can even see the the trend. For example, infographics has become. I, I don't know if, uh, how many academics are actually developing infographics, but it's just storming. And and you notice every time that anyone writes anything on infographic, it's like. They're getting thousands of hits on their, their post because it's an infographic. Even sometimes they're really bad infographics, but it's like infographic. It's an infographic. <laughs> so that's the kind of skill that I think uh, academics can also use to, to present some of the information, especially if it has a lot of facts and figures and so on, to make it more attractive and so on. So do you actually teach people to develop infographics or or in, in that form, a bit more comprehensive than just a slide with graphics and so on? I, I've just been teaching visual design in general, but I would say the, my book is filled with uh, information graphics by done by other people. But what I was talking about tonight with the um, with the icon, you know, with the iconic art, with the icons and the symbols, those are the kinds of things you'd want to, you know, put into one of those simple inf information graphics. And otherwise, there are all these tools for data visualization that people can use. You can just do a search for free data visualization tools. They're all over the internet now too. 
So I hope that. Oh, th oh yeah. Well, yes. Okay. I, I think <laughs> I don't want to keep you up anymore because it's, it's 12 hours difference in the US and it's 12 15. I'm sure you're going to work or something. You have maybe something tomorrow. So. But I just want to say thank you very much, and we really appreciate it. And uh, uh, I hope you don't mind. Is it okay if we make this one available uh, to public in a few days of one week time? Sure. As as a YouTube video, is that okay? Yeah, that'll be great, and and we will share it with you. And we really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and taking your time at the night time. And uh, I think a lot of people can benefit. I benefit a lot, although I do a lot of uh, funny this graphics and so on. But I, I still, I don't, I don't know how cognitive efficient they are. <laughs> Emotionally efficient, maybe okay, but cognitive efficient, I'm not sure, and so on efficiency. So, thank you very much. Can everybody the what the last 15 standing here? Uh, and I have to say that a lot of people, actually your, your presentation peaked at the end, that means that you did a very good presentation. The audience peaked at uh, 30 plus at the end, that's very good, because if you peak at the middle, that means a uh, bell curve, that means you're not so interesting. So definitely it was a, a super interesting uh, presentation and discussion and so on. So thank you very much, thank you, and we really appreciate it. And the, the thing is, I, I have to actually kick out everyone, because when I click that red button, it'll actually say the class is over. Okay. And sometimes in normal classrooms, people leave, but in, in online classes, either they are mentally here or mentally not there, or surfing or something else, but they're still in the classroom, which is quite cool. But uh, you, you can actually, uh, I just say, I have to be the last man on the ship, but thank you very much, and, and uh, if you just want to actually uh, disappear, it's good, but we really appreciate your participation. We just got one joining us now, it's a bit late, <laughs> but we will make the recording available soon, and we'll have another webinar, uh, it's actually on, in one month's time, uh, with, uh, I can see the website, let me just share the website first, and uh, we will close it. Uh, and and we we'll have some other ones also, but uh, we have to confirm them. We have not confirmed them, but we have. Uh, I don't know if you. I think you're familiar with her. We have the next one is uh, Dr. Nelly Dutch. She's an expert in English. I think language. Are you familiar with her, uh, no. Connie Mal Malamet? No, but it sounds very interesting. I'm not familiar. Yeah, she, she she's actually the she. She's a Wiz IQ uh, facilitator. She's, she, I think she's sponsored by Wiz IQ to promote Wiz IQ. Also. So she's, a, she's also an expert using this tool. So I have a lot of questions for her. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. And we really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to close the class in 10 seconds. So for those who have not left, I'm sorry. The class is over. And again, can we ever give, everyone give a clap for the whoever here? Can we give a clap for the, the great presentation and, and uh, knowledge we, that she shared today? Thanks, everyone. Okay, you let me know that right. you're mentally here still. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you very much.